Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Oliver. I'm going to be presenting here on microservices and uh, everything that we're doing wrong with microservices, some experiences I've had, some engineering things I've seen in other organizations. Uh, it's going to be super boring. So now's your chance to escape. Um, other than that, you'll be caught in the tractor beam. Uh, so yeah, let's first just dive into it. Like, who am I specifically, and what what qualifies me to talk about this? Well, first of all, I am the technical founder at a company called Smarty, uh, Smarty.com, Smarty, and we do street address verification. Well, what's that? Well, the easy answer is if you're uh, placing an order online for a given product or item, and you type in your address, and it pops up and says, "Is this your address? Do you mean this?" If it does it correctly or properly. It's my stuff. If it does, if it doesn't wrong, then it's one of our competitors. Um, and uh, in addition to street address verification, we also do type ahead auto completion. So as you're typing the address, uh, it'll just fill it in automatically. And other more boring uh, use cases would include things like re reverse geocoding, uh, so we can tell you what what uh, house or address is for a given coordinate on the planet, as well as rooftop geocoding going the other direction. Um, from a scalability standpoint, we do millions of lookups per second, billions of lookups per day, and trillions of lookups per year. So we've designed it for scalability and uh, all around the microservice architecture paradigms. Well, okay, so what is a microservice? Everyone everyone talks about this, like, oh, let's use microservice. Let's get more microservice-y and let's be less monolithic. Well, okay, so what's a service? Well problem with the word service is it has all these definitions. Uh, oh, a service is something that does something. Well, uh, that doesn't help me at all. Um, and then the idea behind, well, micro just means it's a smaller something that does something. And well, that doesn't help anything either. So it's a completely loose, unstructured term. It's been hijacked in many different ways uh, to mean a lot of different things. So let's try to provide a little bit of a definition here if we can figure something out. So, okay, what's a microservice? Well, it's a noun, it's a, com it's a component which encapsulates a set of behavioral operations within a clear transactional boundary and which can be deployed independently. Okay, let's break that thing down. <laughs> so, uh, so a component, uh, it's, uh, again, it's some behavioral operations and a transactional boundary. Well, a transactional boundary means that these things all happen all together or none of them happen at all. And it's a, a consistency mechanism to make sure that you don't get into an inconsistent state in your database or other stateful uh, systems. Uh, beyond that, it's also independently deployable, meaning um, you can take this piece of software, this, this component, and you can put a main function right in front of it, uh, you know, plop down a config file next to it. You know, if you compile it, that's great. And then you can deploy it or execute it. Um, and so the, uh, the ideal behind a microservice is you have this, this unit and again, it's transactional, it's all or nothing, and by itself, you can deploy it. Now, the other cool part is that you can bundle uh, a lot of these independently deployable units together in their own, in a collective main, and you can actually, uh, for, for operational uh, and deployment ease, you can wrap a bunch of them together and deploy them together. Uh, and we'll get into the particulars here through an example I think that'll help the most. So let's consider a traditional monolithic example. Uh, in a monolithic world where we where you have uh, one one executable that rules them all uh, and uh, in the darkness binds them, um, what you would do is you you'd see a typical place order process. Um, and what you'll see here is you'll see an arrow going to uh, the illustration is actually a laptop. It's just a compute resource of some kind. Uh, the compute resource ideally would be a server in this case. Um, so it would receive an HTTP instruction. Uh, from the browser uh, to place an order, okay? And the place order, your monolithic application would then perform uh, the following steps. It would, number one, call an external HTTP process uh, and it would charge the payment method. Uh, then beyond that, it would then call uh, FedEx or whatever and it would generate the shipping info, uh, shipping label. And then finally, once both of those steps were completed, um, you would then send the purchase confirmation email and payment confirm. You know the, the purchase confirmation, the, the payment info, the the shipping label, and all that stuff. You would send that via email to the end user. Okay, that's great. But um, you know everything works great until it doesn't. Okay. Well, why? What does that mean? Well, what happens when any of these external calls that you made? There's three different calls that we made in this situation. What happens when they fail? And I want to emphasize the when. Uh, 
when things fail, how do you handle it? Um, you ever tried to roll back email? And this kind of reminds me of a, a great email system. And by great, I mean not great email system that I think most of us have used back in the day called Microsoft Exchange Server, typically tethered with uh, Microsoft Outlook as a client. And uh, let's start with this. I can get, what, what if I told you right now, I could guarantee that when you sent an email, somebody could, uh, th that you could guarantee that they would read it. Um, would that be worth anything to you? This is a complete aside from my, my general topic, but Microsoft Exchange actually had this, this guarantee in there that it could guarantee the emails would be read by third parties. And, and what they did, um, well, my Exchange had this ability to pull an email back from the end user. Uh, you could actually send an email within Exchange and then it would revoke or delete the email. That was really cool. It was a rollback for email. Problem, um, it didn't work well when it sent to outside parties. And so what they would do is they would send another email and say, it would say, so-and-so would like to recall the message or to pull it back, the message with the title X, Y, and Z. So if you ever want to guarantee that your, that your end users read your email, all you have to do is prefix the title with so-and-so, you know, uh, Jonathan Oliver would like to recall message, uh, important information about X, Y, and Z. Um, and I can guarantee you they will read it because all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, they recall the message. What don't they want me to see? What are they trying to hide? So anyway, uh, rollback for email doesn't formally exist in any capacity. So coming back to the main topic here, when an external call fails against email, how do you deal with it? So, um, and, and this all, this all is about HTTP, you know, HTTP, uh, is, is not intrinsically reliable by design. It's kind of a best effort system. You make the call and you, you know, out via HTTP and it tries to get the, the request through and it, the request might succeed, but you might not get the response. And that happens all the time. In fact, we see this with browsers. Uh, you load a, you load a page on a, on a browser, just a, a particular web page out there. And like one of the images fails to load, what do you do? Well, you just retry, you just, uh, you just refresh the page and you're good to go. And this all harkens back to some of the earliest uh, things that we, that uh, a lot of the experts uh, figured out it, at Sun Microsystems. In fact, this was called the, the fallacies of distributed computing. Uh, this is rule number one, uh, fallacy number one, I should say. The first fallacy in this in distributed computing, the thing that we as programmers often believe that isn't true is that the network is reliable when in fact it's completely and utterly unreliable. So if the network is unreliable, things are going to go wrong. We have to design for that. And so this monolithic system that calls Stripe and then FedEx and SendGrid, this is a tall order. Like how to do this transactionally as an all or nothing unit, it's very difficult. So, okay. So, and then going back to our contrived example, what happens when this call fails? You know, what do you do when, when um, the uh, email uh, fails? Um, but yeah, let's go with that. Let's say you've, you've done the, the payment, you've charged the car, you generated the shipping label, the truck is on its way, and then you send the email and the email fails. Well, do you, do you tell the truck not to come? What do you do exactly? So, um, and what about payments that already happened? So I mean, obviously you can sleep and retry. Oh, and the other question that you keep running into is, do you block the person that said place order? Do you block them? And they're just spinning, waiting, 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 waiting for the card to get charged and FedEx to get called and the email to get sent. You, are, are they just blocked and waiting for 20 seconds? You know, especially if in a case of a failure, okay, I'm going to sleep and retry. Well, now the caller, like I said, is blocked and he's just paused there, which isn't a good thing. Okay, well, maybe we skip sending the email altogether. Well, is that really a good user experience? Like, oh yeah, by the way, we charged your card. Oh, and a truck is on its way. But uh, yeah, you don't know about it because you never got the email. Um, and in fact, we've even trained users along these lines where we say, okay, uh, you don't want the user to click place order like 20 times in a row. There's different things, we, different mechanisms. We've trained them to only click once and we don't want them to click it 20 different times. Uh, we want our software to handle the failure, not the browser. So, well, let's dive into what the business wants. Um, so ideally, the, the, uh, the caller of, of a microservice, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the term here, like the intricacies of the microservice, the, the, the browser, of course, that end user shouldn't necessarily be burdened with, with the uh, intricacies there, but the, the details of how the microservice operates internally should be, should be kept internally. So uh, retry policies, timeout and so forth. Um, so, but if we don't wanna burden, um, our caller, the browser, with these intricacies, where do they live? Well, we, again, like I said, we want to encapsulate all the logic, 
failure retry in the microservice itself, not in the caller. Well, how do we do that? Okay, this is the heresy. And I'm gonna lose about half of you on this one and that's okay. Don't use HTTP. HTTP is, is again, it's a best effort protocol and again, inherently un un unreliable and we wanna see if we can structure our systems. Uh, now, there are situations where we have to use it, but um, you know, HTTP makes sense when you're calling uh, from a browser to a server, okay? Um, if, you're, if you're a vendor, again, a Stripe, they only expose HTTP, okay, well then we're gonna use HTTP. That's the only thing we've got. But internally, between our systems that we have, between system A and system B that we are in full control of, we don't wanna use HTTP to communicate between them. Instead, we wanna use messaging. Okay, so messaging, is very similar. Well, let's, let's just dive into this. HTTP is very similar to a phone call. And I mean, uh, think about this for a moment. When's the last time you enjoyed getting a phone call? Like when's the last time you're like, oh yes, the phone is ringing. I'm so excited. I mean, I remember like years ago as a kid, like, ooh, the phone's ringing. I wonder if it's for me, but it never was. Kind of like getting your first letter in the mail, like, yay, and now it's just bills. You're like, I don't want to get, want to get these things anymore. In any case, phone calls, both parties have to be online, available, responsive at the exact same time. That's a taller order compared to uh, messaging, uh, similar to email or SMS, text messaging. It's basically, hey, we send a message and we say, at, our, you know, at my convenience, I'm going to deal with this message. Not at, the, not at the sender's convenience, but at my convenience as the receiver or the consumer of the message. So messaging, again, very similar to email. You know, some messages need a reply, others don't. Uh, the sender isn't blocked, and this is the important part, waiting for a response. Okay. So what we have in, in messaging, we have two basic pieces, three basic pieces. We have a producer that, that writes the message, that sends messages, and I, we use a pr produce, publish. There's a bunch of different ways you can describe that. So we stick it in a queue or effectively a mailbox of some kind, usually a third, uh, another system altogether. And then at our convenience, the consumer, when it's ready for work, will read off the queue and do its thing, process the message. Okay, so let's go through our contrived example now um, where we receive uh, an instruction from the browser to place order, okay? The, the, the instruction comes in, our server processes it, and we put a message on the queue. This is now step number two. We dispatch an order placed message. We put it on the queue and we say, hey, the order's been placed. Now, I wanna be very clear, this is step three. Just because we returned an HTTP 200 level response to the caller doesn't mean we've processed and agreed with the order. It simply means we've received the order. This is a, a important domain distinction. Hey, we, we, we've got it. We're looking at it. We're considering it. We, we're looking at all the particulars of it. Um, much like Amazon. I mean, Amazon, uh, if your credit card is declined, you don't get it right there you know, on the spot. You get it. A little bit later, a minute or two later, we'll say, hey, your credit card's declined. Can you please update your credit card? So a very similar situation here. Okay. Um, so now what we do is we're moving on to a different microservice. So coming back to the first one, this is one microservice that receives an order from the browser and puts it on a queue. That's all it does. Next, we, we have another microservice that receives order placed from the queue. So again, uh, it can be a completely different machine. It could be a same physical machine, doesn't particularly matter and it receives order placed from the queue and then calls that external API, uh, in this case, Stripe, uh, and charges the payment method that was provided. Great, the payment has been charged, we're good to go. We then publish the results or dispatch the results of that authorization capture as some kind of like, you know, funds captured message. And we put the results of that onto the queue. And this workflow, uh, and, then, and then in addition, just as a clerical thing, we acknowledge receipt of the incoming message, kind of the equivalent of an HTTP 200, uh, but it's in messaging parlance, we'd say we acknowledge receipt of the incoming message to the queuing infrastructure so that message number, the, the step one is that uh, that message is removed from the queue. Okay, so again, the operation, uh, receive a message off a of queue, do something, make an HTTP call, and then send a message uh, to the next step. Okay, again, this is another microservice. So moving back, moving back for a second, first microservice, receiving an order, second one, uh, then dealing with order placed and so forth. And again, they can be on the same physical hardware. It doesn't matter. It can be uh, different, different uh, hardware. You could put it on different computers on different continents. It doesn't matter. Okay. And they can even be written in different languages for, for all we care. Uh, next microservice, completely unrelated to the first, but you know, tethered in terms of workflow, um, would understand and only deal with the funds captured message. So that message arrives and then it calls the, another HTTP API, FedEx specifically, and generates uh, the shipping label, whatever it needs to happen there. 
and then publishes the result of that as tracking label generated, as an example. Um, and then finally, clerical cleanup work, acknowledge receipt of the incoming message back to the queuing inf infrastructure. So, so far, so good. We've been able to charge the card. Again, that's that's uh, one microservice. We've been able to call FedEx. And, and we'll talk about if FedEx and, and Stripe and so forth are unavailable. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and then ultimately, the workflow is complete when funds captured and tracking messages both arrive. You get received both off the queue. You receive this one a little bit later and you, uh, now, and then you receive the next one a little bit later. And then you finally, when you get both of them in, you call the external HTTP API for send grid or whoever. Um, and you put uh, in that email, the email message that's dispatched, you send out the payment confirmation information and tracking and order information, whatever you need. And then you acknowledge receipt of both those messages ultimately back to the queuing infrastructure. So at any step here, um, there allows us a great deal of flexibility. So each microservice is responsible for very distinct well-defined behavior. And, and I want to be careful about this. This doesn't mean that these are all separate Git repositories. It doesn't mean that they're all, you know, separate mains. I mean, you could have us all be in a single main, but they're all different transactions and they're all different units of work. Um, and so each of these sets of behavior can be put into, um, they can be put into a, uh, in a bundled into a main or multiple mains, again, run on multiple computers, whatever we want. Okay. Now, the error handling like we talked about can become very explicit. So what happens when we get an error message or an error response? And when Stripe is unavailable, well, the, the user, they're unblocked. We've already received the order. And now we're just waiting for, you know, for, for Stripe to process payment. Uh, and if, if Stripe, if we get a decline, well, that's one workflow. Um, if Stripe is unavailable because of some kind of outage, well, uh, we can build in explicit error handling around that, around a business conditions. We'd say, well, if Stripe is unavailable, you could talk to a domain ex expert. You say, well, if Stripe's down for an hour, let's say for some crazy reason, what do we do? Do we send an email to the customer saying, hey, we're working on it? Or do we do we simply retry? There's all kinds of things that we can do. Um, and then the idea here is that we're dealing with, um, you know, exceptions. Um, you don't just like, I mean, back in the glory days of Java, um, and, and even C sharp to a certain extent, it, you basically, all you did was you just throw an exception. You're like, um, failure with this HTTP thing. I don't know what's going on. Just throw an exception. It's somebody else's problem. They'll write it to a log file done. Well, that doesn't work too well. Now, um, we've kind of matured as an industry, at least I hope we have, uh, to where we're not just, oh, throw an exception at somebody else's problem. We actually have to deal with the failure, the failure of the email not sending, the HTTP call failing, the authentication credentials being incorrect, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of things that we need to deal with um, in our application code rather than just, oh, throw a generic exception and log it and move on. Um, so long story short, we, we have now the business guidance around, well, what happens if, what happens when, what happens? And so uh, we can talk about, you know, if the payment gateway was unavailable, again, retry. Um, if it's declined, well, we need to do this workflow. Again, we need to send a different email. Um, and if the email gateway is unavailable, well, okay, well, let's just wait a little bit longer. Um, and, and maybe there's a point at which, uh, heaven forbid, we have to call the customer on a phone, something like that. But long story short, or maybe, maybe there's a secondary email gateway. Um, who says that that SendGrid is the be-all, end-all solution for all email sending? Maybe you try to send on SendGrid because that's your preferred provider. But after that, you're like, well, you know what? SendGrid's been down. So let's go over to uh, Amazon's uh, simple email service or Postmark or something like that. There's a bunch of different cool services out there that would do that. So you can then make business decisions around, well, what happens when this thing is unavailable or not responding properly? Okay. Now, there are a couple of things that we need to deal with um, uh, that, that actually, again, some additional advantages let's get to, and then we'll talk about some, some quirks and stuff for mess messaging. Um, so we need to, um, if we wanna scale up, in other words, let's imagine you had so many orders that a single HTTP system that was like payment processor just couldn't possibly keep up. Well, it's much like the grocery store. If a given lane is getting too long, open up another lane, open up another register, again, a grocery store. And, and fortunately, unlike cash registers at a grocery store, um, we have a lot more options than that with, with computing because we should be able to fire up many dozens or hundreds of, of uh, uh, cash register equivalents in the terms of work, in terms of workers. And all we have to do is we watch the queue. If the 
uh, order order placed messages, if we have uh, more than a certain number of them in the queue, or the average wait time or the 99 percentile wait time of a given message in the queue exceeds n, n milliseconds or seconds, well, let's fire up more workers and start processing uh, more of those orders. Okay, uh, And also, um, in terms of latency, and these are, again, advanced characteristics, um, there are certain kinds of things that you can do where you can process groups of messages at a time. Obviously, when you're working with an HTTP API out, out of band, like when you're calling one, I generally speaking like to do one message at a time. Um, but if you have groups of messages that are operating against a, a transactional resource like a database, you can process many hundreds or even thousands of messages at a time. And you get a lot of, you batch them together and that helps with your uh, latency. It helps with your, uh, you amortize the, amortize the cost of the, the transaction. Um, so Again, batching uh, helps us with that. So there are certain latency characteristics that you can uh, you can't overcome them and overcome them entirely, but there's lots that you can do to help speed things up. Um, now, this right here, there's a there's a really amazing trading platform, a uh, stock algorithmic uh, trading platform called LMAX that is very much worth um, uh, looking at. They have a, a system called the Disruptor, is what they call it. Um, and it can process five to 10 million messages per second with one millisecond of latency on a single physical machine. Yes, you read those metrics, right? It's actually getting better and better. They're, they're getting faster and faster. Um, and then there's some more, there's other ways to deal with messaging. Another way is called uh, CQRS, also event sourcing. You can, without too much trouble, should be able to get to roughly 100,000 messages a second that you can process. So these are, these are some pretty high, I mean, 100,000 messages a second is a lot of messages, uh, just all things considered. And, and there's very few systems out there that would actually need that kind of, uh, th that kind of, those kinds of like performance characteristics. Okay, so what are, what's some of the, the summary here? Uh, again, HTTP-based resources, again, receive a message, write it to a queue, okay? And, and then if you need more, uh, if you need to receive more HTTP messages, just spin more up, okay? And then for message-based resources, you watch the queues, and add more workers to process the queue. So if the queues are getting a little bit full or if the queues are getting um, a little bit longer than you want, you can always add more workers. If a worker goes down, if a, a single node goes down, just have your control plane. Ideally, you're using something like Kubernetes, Nomad. Uh, there's a bunch of these different systems out there that will help you uh, bring another worker online and, and just bring it back automatically so you don't have to be woken up at 3 a.m. No one likes that. Well, some people do, but I don't. And uh, and then again, if wait times in a queue approaches the limit, bring up more consumer workers online to process that message. Again, very similar to opening uh, grocery store checkout stuff. So with that, um, I will be uh, available here on chat just for a few minutes uh, to answer questions. And, uh, and, and actually, uh, let me back up and say it this way, at the booth, we would like uh, you to come over there. If you have questions, we're happy to answer those. And please give me, give me some curveballs, give me some hard stuff around messaging. I'd, I'd really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for your time.